Romans 11, please. Romans 11. And we're going to start reading at verse number 25. Romans 11 and verse number 25. And as you know, we stated this last week, we are beginning a series of messages on biblical prophecy. Now, the ultimate goal, the ultimate end game of this series is going to be, uh, in a sense, a defense of what we call the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. If you wonder what that means, what I believe and am convinced that the Bible teaches is, is that there is going to come on this world one of these days, we don't know when, but one of these days, there will be a seven-year period of time prophesied in the Bible, specifically in the book of Daniel and Revelation. There's going to be a period of time of seven years. We, we call it, we've coined the phrase, tribulation period. There may be other names. In fact, I have another, another name I'm going to call it, and I'll introduce that to you maybe next week or the week after. Uh, but that, that seven-year period of time is going to come upon this world and it'll be a seven-year period of time of the wrath of God. During that seven-year period of time, the Antichrist will be here. That's when the mark of the beast is going to show up. At the end of the seven-year period of time, Jesus is coming back to this earth to set up his kingdom, and he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. And when he comes back to this earth, we're coming back with him, and we're going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ for 1,000 years. The question is, when do we go to the Lord? When are we raptured? When do we meet the Lord? The Bible says that you and I are going to meet the Lord in, in the clouds. So when does that take place? And when does it take place in regards to that seven-year period of time? I believe that the Bible teaches that we'll be taken out of this world, raptured, we'll meet the Lord in the clouds before that seven-year period of time takes place. That's what I believe the Bible teaches. So that's what we're going to do. That, that's the end game, if you will, to defend that, to prove that, to show that. But in order to get to that place, I feel like we need to spend a few weeks laying down some groundwork, some important truths that are related to that time and that event. And one of those very important truths we find here in Romans 11, not just Romans 11, uh, we find it throughout the Scriptures but we're going to begin in Romans 11, verse 25, examining, and we're not going to do an exhaustive study tonight. I, I could spend weeks on this subject, but I, I really just want to touch it tonight, deal with it, prove it, show it tonight, and then we'll move on to the next subject. But we're in Romans chapter 11, verse 25, where the Bible says, For I would not, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, I would not, or I, I, I do not desire, brethren, I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. So there's, there's something he's about to talk to us about that if we're not careful, we can be grossly ignorant about. In fact, I'll say this, I believe there's been a lot of ignorance when it comes to this subject right here. And even today, I feel like there is... Much ignorance when it comes to this subject. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest, in other words, if you are ignorant, there's the possibility you should be wise in your own conceits. He says, if you don't get this right, it's probably because you're conceited. You're wise in your own conceits. You think you've got it figured out. You think you're smart and you're actually ignoring clear biblical truth. Now, I'm, I'm making very harsh statements right now. But I believe what we're about to look at, the reason why people don't believe what we're about to look at is because of their, their wise and their own conceits. They're ignorant and they're wise and their own conceits. And I know, I know I'm saying that about some very good people some very godly preachers that have lived down through the centuries, that love God, love God's word. But, but I'm just telling you what the page says. The words on the page say this. I didn't say this. These are not Joy Wampler's words. The Bible says, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, 
lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. So if you're ignorant of this, if you don't believe this, then you are conceited and ignorant of a very important truth. What is that truth? What is that mystery that we need to, to know about? Well, he says in the middle of the verse, here it is, that blindness in part, not completely, not wholly, but in part, is happened to Israel, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. And that blindness is in part until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Then in verse 26, And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. I want to take my title, my subject, from verse 26, from the phrase, So all Israel shall be saved. So all Israel shall be saved. That's my title, that's my subject. All Israel shall be saved. Now, you may say, well, what's, what's the big deal about this preacher? I believe how an individual deals with this subject is going to play a big part in how they deal with a whole lot of other prophetic issues. But here is what I believe the biggest deal is. Do we believe the words on the page or not? Do the words on the page mean what they say? Or do we insert into those words what we want them to say? I believe, and I believe based upon these verses and many other verses, and Lord willing, we're going to look at some of those other verses. I believe that there is coming a day that the nation of Israel, the Jewish race of people, I believe there is coming a day that every Jewish person Every true, genuine Jewish person on this planet, one of these days, is going to be saved. They're going to be saved. Thank you, Brother Chanel. appreciate that dogmatic amen. So I know one of us is in agreement tonight. Now, what I'm not going to do tonight, this is more, more than likely next week or maybe the week after. We'll see how long this takes. I'm not going to talk tonight about the when as much. I personally believe the win of it is at the end of that seven-year tribulation period. Now, there, there will be other Jewish people saved during the tribulation period, and there are Jewish people being saved even today. But I'm talking about the wholesale complete, that nation being saved, being born again, becoming a Christian nation, receiving Christ, every single one of them. I believe they will be saved at the end of that seven-year tribulation period. I'll deal with that when we deal with that seven-year period of tribulation. Right now, I just want to prove the fact that one of these days, God's going to save all those people. Now, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that every Jew that's ever lived is going to get saved. If a Jew is in hell right now, alongside a Gentile, there is no salvation once you're in hell. We're talking about at the point in time when Jesus returns to this earth and saves that nation at the Battle of Armageddon, at that point in time, God is going to do a miraculous work and that nation is going to turn their eyes to Jesus and trust Him. I'm going to show you the verses. But I'm not as interested in the when as I am the reality that that is going to happen. The reason why I'm emphasizing this is because there are those who have been around many years who teach that God is done. He's completely finished with the nation of Israel and God is not going to turn back to that nation. In the Old Testament, you have God raised up Abraham and you have this nation created by God, the nation of Israel. Then Jesus came to this earth and that nation rejected their Messiah. They crucified their Messiah. Then in the book of Acts, uh, through the work of the apostles, God gave that nation a second chance. But then in Acts chapter number 7, you have that great deacon Stephen preaching to the Jewish leaders and instead of responding to Jesus Christ, 
They rejected once again, just as they did the Old Testament prophets, just as they did John the Baptist, just as they did the apostles, just as they did uh, Jesus Christ. They rejected them. And they stoned Stephen. And from the stoning of Stephen, God began to make his turn toward the Gentiles. Now, today, the church of Jesus Christ, it's made up of Jewish people and Gentiles. But God had given that nation another chance and they rejected Jesus Christ again. So right now, the nation of Israel is on a shelf, if you will. God has called time out. He's pushed them to the side. Now, individual Jews can be saved. Do not misunderstand me. And thank God many individual Jewish people have come to Christ. But as a nation, as a race, they've been pushed to the side in judgment. But there will come a day, every Jewish person that is alive at the return of Jesus Christ will trust Jesus as their Savior. I believe that's what the Bible teaches. Now, I'm not going to get into this big word I'm about to give you real quickly. But I am a dispensationalist. And simply put, just, just to keep it real simple, a dispensationalist, we, we notice the differences in the scriptures and the periods of time and how God deals with humanity. A lot of people believe that what I'm teaching tonight about Israel being saved is just something you dispensationalists made up. But that's not true. It's not historically and factually true. There are people who are amillennialist and postmillennialist who believe that Israel will be saved at the end. Uh, there's a, a, a Calvinist named R.C. Sproul. He passed away a few, few years ago. I believe he's a Presbyterian. He certainly was not a dispensationalist. But even he said he believed just before the Lord Jesus Christ returns to this earth, he believes that God was going to do a special work and save that nation. And he is not what I am. I have a quote. I'm not going to read it to you. It's a long quote uh, from John Gill. Here in my notes, John Gill pastored the church that Charles Spurgeon pastored. Charles Spurgeon pastored in the 1800s. A hundred years before in the 1700s, John Gill pastored that same church. And John Gill, I have it in my notes right here, John Gill believed that the nation of Israel, all of them will be saved at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is not just simply a dispensational teaching. Oh, you bunch of pre-tribulationists, you bunch of Baptists from the South, all y'all believe this stuff. No, many people down through the centuries believe this because it's in the Bible. And I'm going to tell you who does believe it. Those who are ignorant and conceited, according to verse 25. I know that's harsh and mean, but that's what the Bible says. So we need to know what the Scriptures say because this is very important when it comes to prophecy and prophetic truth. So let's look at these verses real quickly one more time, and then we'll maybe span out and look at some other passages as well. Verse 25, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part is happening to Israel. What does that mean in part? Some of them are saved and some of them are not. That's simply what it means. The Apostle Paul, who's writing the book of Romans, he was saved, but he's a Jewish person. He's a part of the nation of Israel. He's a Jewish person. He desires for his Jewish brethren to be saved. Look at chapter 10, verse number 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. That was his desire. Now, he's saying, I want all of them to be saved. Some of them are. All of the disciples were Jews. Every one of them. The Apostle Paul is a Jew. You find many Jewish people in the Bible and down through history that are saved. That means that nation in part is saved. But the other part is blind. Those who have rejected Jesus Christ, they're still, just like the Gentiles, are in blindness. So, that blindness in part, verse 25, is happened to Israel. I'm back in chapter 11, verse 25. It's happened to Israel. Watch this. Until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. 
When God is finished dealing with the Gentiles, he is going to save that nation. When is God done dealing with the Gentiles? At the end of the tribulation period. He's saving Gentiles in the tribulation period. But he's finished dealing with Gentile nations. At the end of that period of time, and that's when the blindness in part is removed. It says they're blind in part until. That word until is the key. That means there's going to come a day they're not going to be blind anymore. And notice the contrast is Israel and Gentiles. A lot of these people who teach this, they, they teach what is called replacement theology or continuation theology. And what that is, is they believe that the church is now Israel and God's never going to deal with the nation of Israel again. We have replaced her completely. And now God's never going to deal with that nation again. The problem is, this Israel right here cannot be the church because they're blind in part. If you're part of the church, you're saved. If you're part of the body of Christ, you're saved. You can't be a part of the body of Christ and go to hell. This Israel right here is physical, racial, national Israel because he's contrasted to the Gentiles. When the Gentiles, when God's finished dealing with Gentiles, that's racial. When God's finished dealing with the Gentiles, that's a non-Jew. Regardless of the skin color, it's a non-Jew. That's a Gentile. When God's finished dealing with Gentiles, Israel's blindness will be completely removed. We're talking about race. We're talking about nationality. That's what the Bible says. And so in verse 26, he says, And so, based upon verse 25 and the other chapters and other verses, And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, just like the Bible declares, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, Jesus Christ, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. I'm going to say something about Jacob here in just a minute. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. God's going to take away their sins one of these days. It's called Jacob. Israel's called Jacob in verse 26. That's an interesting name there. Jacob means supplanter, schemer, a thief. Remember, God promised in the Old Testament, you had the two brothers, Esau and Jacob, and God promised that the younger would be over the elder, and the elder is going to serve the younger. Y'all remember that promise? That was the promise. God promised it. It was going to happen. But Jacob decided... He is going to help God out. And he schemed and connived and lied and deceived. And he got the blessing. He got the birthright. But he didn't get it God's way. He got it his own scheming way. Today, I hear this a lot. I don't believe that God is ever going to have anything to do with that nation. I, I, have, I have books where they say this. God's never going to deal with that nation. God's never going to deal with those people again. And then they spend page after page and chapter after chapter in these books talking about how wicked Judaism is and how wicked the nation of Israel is. And I'm not denying the factuality of how evil Judaism may be. Judaism is not akin to Christianity. I'm not going to get into any details and certainly wouldn't do it in a mixed crowd. There are things that take place in the religion of Judaism that will make the hairs on the back of your neck stand straight up. Vile, evil, and disgusting. Just a few years ago, I don't know if it's the case right now, but just a few years ago, ranked number one in the world being, being friendly and applauding and accepting of homosexuality and the transgender, and so on and so forth. Number one in the world was Tel Aviv. That was just a few years ago. may still be the same today. They are enacting more and more laws in the nation of Israel to try to prevent the gospel from getting out in the nation of Israel. They do not like Jesus over there. They like us coming and doing tours because they make money off of it, but they do not like our gospel and they don't like our God. And, and I can't say, you can't say, well, you know, we and the Jewish people, we worship the same God, 
uh, they just haven't accepted their Messiah. That's not true. Jesus said, he, Jesus told the Pharisees of his day, he said, he said, if you actually believe Moses, you'd believe me because Moses spoke of me. The fact that they don't believe in Jesus Christ is proof they don't believe Moses. They don't believe the Old Testament. I can list the sins. It's mostly Jewish men that are running the news media today. It is mostly Jewish men that are running the music industry today, the Hollywood movie industry. It's mostly Jewish men. It's mostly Jewish people that are ru uh, running the pornographic industry today. It is mostly Jewish men running the banking industry today. And I can go on and I can go on. It is mostly Jewish men that are doing these things. And that's just a truth. And that's just a fact. And what these replacement theology guys say, see, look, they're just about globalism and they're about taking over the world and they're about the Antichrist and so on and so forth. And I do believe they're going to accept the Antichrist. They're going to see him, I believe, as their Messiah. There's no doubt about it. I believe that. So why is it that these Jewish leaders have their hands in all of these things that seem to make the world go around and they've got their hands in these things. Paul calls them Jacob. See, in Romans, in fact, take, go to Romans 4, please. Romans 4, real quickly. We'll come back to Romans 11. But look at Romans 4. And verse 13 of Romans 4 is talking about Abraham. It's talking about Abraham. Watch this. For the promise that he, Abraham, should be the heir of the what? The world. Abraham is to be heir of the world. That's promised. Just like God promised Jacob, you're going to be above Esau. God promised Abraham, you're going to be up above the whole world. But here, go back to Romans 11. Look at verse 26. He says, this deliverer is going to come and will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. You know what Jacob is trying to do today? Trying to get the whole world without their Messiah. Just like Jacob got the birthright and the blessing without doing it God's way, Jacob today, the nation of Israel, is trying to get the world without their Messiah. Without, without their God. They're Jacob. They're supplanting. Here's how big God is. God's so great that God took that one man, Jacob, and made him Israel. He says, your name's not Jacob anymore. You're Israel now. And God's going to take that nation. Verse 26, the last word in the verse is Jacob, but look at the first part of the verse. And so Israel, all Israel shall be saved. When Jesus comes back, all of those Jacobs are going to become Israel. And all Israel is going to be saved. Well, I just think they're so bad. And I think Judaism is so bad. Well, I think you're so bad. And I'm so bad. We're all so bad. Yet Jesus' blood was able to save us and wash all of our sins away. It don't matter who's good and who's bad. We're all bad. All have sinned to come short of the glory of God. And if God can save me, he can save Israel. He can save Israel. And I'm convinced that that nation will be saved. Now take your Bible. Go to Matthew chapter number 21, please. Matthew 21. I mentioned a type of theology called replacement theology or continuation theology where they teach that God has replaced Israel with the church and he's never going to deal with Israel again. Now we must, we must admit, and while I don't believe in replacement theology, we have to admit some replacement took place. Let's, let's look and see what the Bible says. Look at verse number tw uh, 33. Matthew 21 Look at verse 33. 
Jesus says, hear another parable. There was a certain householder, a man who owned a home. He owned fields. He owned a vineyard. Watch this. Which planted a vineyard. I'm going to give you the, the typology as we go down through the text. This householder is a picture of God the Father. Everybody got that? This householder is a picture of God the Father. Okay? There was a certain householder, God the Father, which planted a vineyard, that's the kingdom of God, and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and left it out, let it out, rented it out to husbandmen, farmers. That is the nation of Israel. So God the Father has the kingdom, the vineyard, and he lets it out, if you will. He has contracted these farmers to take care of the land and to bring forth fruit. And he, the Father, the Bible says in verse 33, went into a far country. So he goes away. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he, that, that householder, picture of God the Father, sent his servants to the husbandman that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandman took his servants, the, the farmers, and they beat one and killed another and stoned another. And he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. So here's the picture. God the Father has a vineyard, the kingdom of God. He, he has contracted Israel to take care of this kingdom. And so now... God the Father is sending His servants. Those are those Old Testament prophets. He's sending His Old Testament prophets to the nation of Israel to straighten them up, get them right. But they kill them. They imprison them. They mistreat them. So, verse 37, But last of all, He sent unto them His Son. We all know who that is. That's a picture of Jesus. Saying, here's what the father is saying. Here's what the husbandman is, excuse me, the householder is saying. They will reverence my son. But when the husbandman saw the son, when Israel sees the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And they called him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. They crucified Jesus. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, he, here's Jesus asking those Jewish people a question. When the Lord, therefore of the vineyard, God the Father, if you will, cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? The husbandmen that killed the servants or the prophets, they killed the Son, Jesus Christ. What is going to be done to them? Verse 41, they say to him, He, God the Father, will dis miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out of his vineyard unto other husbandmen which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Here's what they say. The Jewish people answer like this. They say, God, they say that that householder is going to destroy those farmers that killed his son. Then he's going to give that vineyard to somebody else that will produce fruit. They, they saw the parable. But they didn't realize fully yet that, it, that he was talking about them. Look at verse 40, 42. Jesus saith unto them, did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. He's talking about himself. Jesus Christ is the stone that the builders rejected. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, Jesus says to the Jewish people, Say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. Because you killed the prophets, and ultimately they're going to crucify the Son. So the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation. How many nations there in that verse? One. Given to one nation, a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. He said, that's what's going to happen to you, Israel. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. Here's what Jesus told them. You were given a kingdom. You were given a spiritual kingdom and a physical kingdom. I saved you by grace and I also gave you an earthly monarchy, an earthly kingdom with earthly laws. I gave you a physical kingdom. I gave you a spiritual kingdom. But you rejected the Messiah. Jesus is saying this about himself. He says, so I'm going to take the kingdom from you and I'm going to give it to a nation that will bring forth fruit. So there is, in a sense, a replacement taking place here. God's going to set Israel to the side, and he's going to work with a different nation. 
The question is, who is that nation? Who is that one nation that God deals with? Take your Bible, go to 1 Peter, please. 1 Peter. And if I'm going too fast for you tonight, you can ask me questions later or go back and watch the recording and pause and rewind and pause and rewind. 1 Peter 2. Look at verse number 9. That, that nation that now has the kingdom. Watch this. 1 Peter 2 verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Who is, he's ta who is he talking about? He's talking about us. He's talking about the New Testament church. God took the kingdom from them and gave it to the church. However, remember, Israel had a physical kingdom and a spiritual kingdom. The question is, did God give us the physical and the spiritual kingdom? Or did he just give us the spiritual? Take your Bible, go to Romans real quickly. Romans 14. I know we're jumping around and studying the Bible. This will do, help some of y'all catch up on your Bible reading. Romans 14. Go to Romans 14. Look at verse number 17. Romans 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, that's physical but righteousness and peace and joy of the Holy Ghost. That's spiritual. God did not give us the physical kingdom. He gave us the spiritual. The physical is put on hold. God will give that back to Israel when they get saved, and God will set up his kingdom on this earth. Until then, we don't have a physical kingdom in this world. We have a spiritual kingdom. Hope you understand that. You say, what's the big deal? The Catholic Church thinks that they are a physical kingdom. Many of your Protestant churches think that they have a physical kingdom. That's why even after the Reformation, many of your Protestant denominations like the Lutherans and the Presbyterians, they would persecute other Christians. They would take up arms and attack Baptists because they believed they had the physical kingdom. They believed in ultimate replacement theology. We replace Israel. We're Israel now, and we've got the spiritual and the physical kingdom. The post-millennialists, I spoke about them last week. They believe we're going to bring in the physical kingdom, not just spiritual, but the physical kingdom. They believe that the church itself is going to bring in the physical kingdom. God didn't give us the physical kingdom. God gave us the, gave us the spiritual kingdom. Everybody see that in Romans 14. God gave us the spiritual kingdom. There certainly was a replacement that took place. God put them on the shelf. Now he has the church. But we did not take over the monarchy. We did not take over the physical reign of any Jewish king. The next Jewish king that's going to rule and reign is Jesus Christ himself when he comes back to this earth. Go to Matthew 23, please. Matthew 23. Are you all okay? Go to Matthew 23. If y'all will bear with me, if, you, if you'll let me go a little bit longer, I'd like to finish this tonight and uh, I just have a few verses just to point out and hopefully it'll be a, a tremendous blessing to you. Go to Matthew 23. Look at verse 37. Where Jesus is lamenting over Jerusalem. If you have a study Bible, it probably says that right above there. It says... Uh, the lament over Jerusalem or something of that effect. This is Jesus crying over the city of Jerusalem. Jesus is about to go to the cross. He's about to die. Uh, Jerusalem has rejected him. And watch this, verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. That's that parable he, he spoke about just a moment ago. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen, gathered her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. You didn't want that. Behold, your house, that's that temple in Jerusalem that they were sacrificing animals to. 
Behold, your house, your temple is left unto you desolate. By the way, uh, just a few years after this, about 40 years to be exact, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. The Roman army came in, invaded Israel. They actually invaded in 67 A.D. and in 70 A.D. The temple was completely destroyed. Over a million Jews were killed. Terrible, terrible bloody time. He said, your house is left desolate. God's not going to have anything to do with that temple anymore. And it was destroyed by the Romans 40 years later. So your house is left desolate. But look at verse 39. For I say unto you, he's talking to Jerusalem now. Ye, Jerusalem, shall not see me henceforth. You will not see me again from this time on. He doesn't say forever. Replacement theology would assume that he's saying forever. But no, he doesn't say forever. He says from henceforth till. There's going to come a day they're going to see Jesus again. And here is what's going to take place when they see Jesus again. Till ye shall say, blessed is he that cometh. In the name of the Lord. Jesus said, your house is left in you desolate until the day you say, as a nation, Jerusalem, as a nation, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. When Jesus comes, see, you understand, at the battle of Armageddon, Israel is going to be surrounded. The valley of Megiddo is going to be completely filled with soldiers, global soldiers. Soldiers from all the nations of the world are going to be gathered in that valley in the valley of Jezreel, the valley of Megiddo, there in Israel. Israel's going to be in hiding. And the armies of this world, they're going to try to destroy Jesus Christ and Israel. And they're going to find out both of those was a mistake. Because the heavens are going to open up like a scroll. Jesus is going to come out on a white battle stallion, Re Revelation chapter 19. He's going to make his descent, and he's going to des destroy the armies of this world. And there's little Israel hiding and they're going to say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And they're going to receive their Messiah on that day. Now take your Bible, go to Luke 21, please. Luke 21. Just a moment ago, I told you about 70 A.D. When Israel was destroyed, the temple was destroyed. Jesus prophesies about this. And in Luke chapter 21, in verse 24, here's what Jesus prophesies about that day in 70 A.D. He says, And they, the nation of Israel, shall fall by the edge of the sword. That was to the Romans, the Roman sword. They're going to fall by the edge of the sword. And shall be led away captive into all nations. There's been at least three dispersions of Israel in history. The first one, in the Old Testament, when the Assyrians invaded the northern kingdom and they, they scattered the, the ten northern tribes throughout the world. The second was Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar invaded Judah, the southern kingdom, and he brought many of them back to Babylon with him. That's where you get Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and all of them. He brought them back. That was the second one. The third one was in 70 A.D. when the Romans invaded Israel and destroyed the nation of Israel, destroyed the temple. And right here it is, they were led away captive into all nations. Today, right now, every nation on this planet, there's a Jew there. There's a Jewish person somewhere in every nation on this planet. The Bible says, And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. By the way, it still is. It's still being trodden down by the Gentiles. Until... That means there's going to come a day it's not going to be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Don't that sound a lot like Romans eleven twenty five? 25? Blindness in part is happening to Israel until, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Sounds like that right there, doesn't it? Because it's the same exact time. It's the same time. So when that happens, Israel shall be saved. Now go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Y'all still okay? Yeah. All right, four of you were, praise the Lord. rest of you, take a nap and do what, do what you need to do. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse number 1. This is Luke. Luke is the writer of the book of Acts. He says, verse 1, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus. That former treatise is what we know as the gospel of Luke. That's the former treatise, the former letter, if you will, the former document. 
The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, gave, had, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. So that's the Gospel of Luke. It was what Jesus had taught all the way till his ascension to heaven. Verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, that's the crucifixion, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them, being seen by the disciples, 40 days. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So for 40 days on and off, Jesus has talked to the, the, to the, to the disciples, been teaching them about the kingdom of God. For 40 days on and off, he's talking to the disciples about the kingdom of God. If, God, if Jesus is never going to deal with Israel again, that would have been a real good time to mention that. This is after the, after the cross. This is after the resurrection. If Jesus, if God was done with Israel, this is a real good time to say it. I'm done with them. Never going to deal with them again. After 40 days of hearing about the kingdom of God, look at verse number 6. This is the day Jesus went back to heaven. Verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? After 40 days of hearing about the kingdom of God, they're asking, are you going to do it right now? If God was finished with Israel, and here they are asking this question, either Jesus is a terrible teacher, or these guys are big dummies. We know neither one of those things are true. The reason why they're asking, Lord, are you going to do it right now, is because somewhere in those 40 days, he told them he's going to do it again. That's part of his plan. In fact, look at the next verse. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. He didn't tell him he's not going to do it. He said, It's not for you to know when I'm going to do it. Israel is going to be saved. Let me give you another verse. Go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse number 15. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 15. If y'all would, after the service, just tell me how awesome it was. Because I'm going I'm to lose sleep tonight thinking I kept y'all too long. So if y'all lie to me after the service, that would really help me out, help me sleep better. 2 Corinthians 3, verse number, you'd be surprised how many preachers lose sleep over it. I kept them too long. I gave them too much. 2 Corinthians 3. Uh, verse number 15. But even unto this day, talking about the Jewish people, when Moses is read in their synagogues, when they're reading the Old Testament, the first five books of the Bible, the veil is upon their heart. Watch this. The veil, that blindness is upon, notice, their heart. That word there is plural. Y'all see that? that? There is plural. But the word heart is singular. That nation has one heart. Their one heart has a veil on it. Watch this. Nevertheless, verse 60, when it, that's singular, when their one heart shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Y'all see that? They have one heart as a nation that has rejected Messiah, but when their one heart turns to the Lord, that veil is going to be removed and they're going to receive Jesus as their Messiah. Praise the Lord. Now go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. We're really getting close to wrapping it up. All the babies said amen. Matthew 24. Verse number 31. Verse number 31 of Matthew 24. There's something this verse has in common. The pre-wrath believers, the post-tribulation believers... The amillennialist, many of the postmillennialists, they all believe that this is the rapture of the church. They all believe it. They all teach it. If you listen to a very popular preacher online, Stephen Anderson, if you listen to him talk about when he thinks the rapture happens, he thinks it happens right here. If you listen to Alan Kirshner, a very popular pre-wrath preacher, Stephen Anderson is a King James only pre-wrathian. Alan Kirshner is a modern translation pre-wrath advocate. They believe the same thing, they just use different translations to, to get to the, where they want to be. They all believe 
that verse 31 is the rapture of the church. And my goodness, when you read it, it almost looks like it. Look at this. And then, see, let's see, verse 31. And he shall send his angels. Okay, there's angels here. Well, does it first Thessalonians 4 talk about the archangel that's going to be with us at the rapture? With the great sound of a trumpet. Well, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, that there's going to be a trumpet sounding at the rapture of the church. Great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect. Well, we're elect. We're, we saw that Sunday night, I believe it was. We're elect. We shall gather together his elect from the four winds. Well, uh, we're going to be gathered together one of these days at the rapture. I mean, you, you see how this looks like the rapture? Y'all see that? And then it says, from one end of heaven to the other. Does that sound like in the clouds? We're, 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 we're in the sky and we're covering the sky up with all the saints of God that are up there, me and the Lord. Y'all can see why that looks like the rapture. Now, if this is the rapture, look at verse number 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. So if this is the rapture, that means the rapture happens after the tribulation. The post-tribbers are right and the pre rathens are right. We have a, Houston, we have a problem. So, is this the rapture? I'm convinced that it is not. This is not when you and I are going to meet the Lord in the air. I'm not going to get into all of it. I do want to touch on a couple of things. Take your Bible. Notice, well, let, let's stay here just a minute. Look at the phrase here. He shall send his angels. He shall going to send his angels. By the way, John 14, the Bible, Jesus said, he said, I will come, and, I will come to you. I'll come get you. Right here, he's sending somebody to get, get these people. The rapture, Jesus himself. Paul says, the Lord himself shall descend. He's not sending angels after us. He's coming himself after us, okay? Because we're his bride. We're his bride. I didn't send somebody else to go pick up Kelly in Georgia. I went and got her and brought her to Spartanburg. I went and got her. Jesus isn't going to send somebody else to go get his bride. He's coming to get his bride. That means this isn't his bride here. This is not his bride. Great sound of a trumpet. There's some things I can say about that, but I'm going I'm to leave that alone for right now. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds. From the four winds. Hold your place in Matthew 24. Hold your hand there and go to Zechariah in the Old Testament. It's not too far back. You, you, as you flip backwards, you'll find Malachi and Zechariah. Go to Zechariah 2. Real quick, I promise you, we're almost done. I'm not saying how long that's going to be, but I am saying that it is almost done. Look at verse number 6. Of Zechariah 2. This is talking about Jerusalem, by the way. It's talking about the Jewish people in Zechariah 2. He begins with some Santa Claus language in verse 6. Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord. For I have spread, watch this, I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heaven, saith the Lord. Who was spread of the four winds? These verses say Israel was, not the church. Israel. The spread of the four winds. Everybody see that? Now go back to Matthew 24, verse 31. So the four winds, and I can show you Ezekiel 37, Revelation 7. Four winds always have to do with the nation of Israel. Go, go, go run some references. Brother Caleb, go run references on the four winds. You'll see every time it has to do with the nation of Israel, not the church. Now, watch this. The last phrase, from one end of heaven to the other. That sounds like the sky, preacher. The rapture, and they're going, to be up, they're going to be gathered together in the sky. That sounds like us. But is he talking about the sky here? That's the question. Is he talking about the sky? Go to Nehemiah 1 real quickly. Two more passages, and I promise you, we're done. Nehemiah 1. And look at verse number 9. Nehemiah 1, verse 9. Nehemiah is praying. They want to rebuild the temple, want to rebuild the city. He's praying. He's praying to God and he says this in Nehemiah 1 verse 9. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments, this is, this is what God said in his word. And actually, let's go back to verse 8. I'm sorry, verse 8. Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses said, if ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. That's what Jesus said in Luke 21 verse 24. You be spread among the nations. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were cast, uh, of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven. 
Yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set in my name. He says that Israel being scattered is scattered to the uttermost part of heaven. When he's using the word heaven, he's not talking about the sky. He's talking about as far as the world goes. He's still talking in earthly language, though he uses the word heaven. And by the way, Nehemiah is quoting Deuteronomy 30. This will be our last passage, I promise. Go to Deuteronomy 30. I promise with two fingers crossed. Deuteronomy 30, verse 1. Deuteronomy 30. I'm going to start reading you, verse 1. You can catch up when you get there. And it came to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations. Remember, Jesus said they're going to be scattered in all nations. Among all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee. And thou shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, and with all thine heart, there's that heart's going to turn to, to the Lord, and with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity. Luke 21, verse 24, I don't know if you, you've, don't know if you remember it or not, but Jesus said they're going to be led captive in all nations. Here he's reversing that captivity. And have compassion upon thee and will return at his return, at God's return, at the second coming, and gather thee from all the nations. There's that gathering. Where the Lord thy God has scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out unto the uttermost parts of heaven. Are there any Jewish people floating up around in the sky? No. But he's using that language to describe how far he's sending them into the world. Everybody see that? There's not a bunch of Jewish people in the clouds. But he's using the word heaven, indicating how far he's sending them on this earth. If, thy, if any of thine be driven out of the uttermost parts of heaven, from thence, from there, will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possess. We'll stop right there. Matthew 24, 31. He's going to gather his elect from the four winds, one end of heaven to the other. What he's saying is, I've scattered my elect, the nation of Israel, and I'm going to bring them all back into the land. Matthew 24, 31 is not your rapture. Don't let a pre-wrathian or a post-tribulationist or anybody else try to convince you that's when you're going out. That's at the end of the tribulation period, and that's when God gathers the nation of Israel back to its land. It has nothing to do with you and I. So what's the point? Because if that's not the rapture in Matthew 24, 31, it must have happened before all that. That's why I believe in a pre-trib rapture. Thank you all for enduring the study tonight. I appreciate your, your guts and glory for blasting this teaching. I want to just go ahead. There would no sense in having a part two of this. Israel's going to be saved as a nation. God's going to save that nation. But more importantly tonight, he's not going to do it tonight. More importantly than not, there could be somebody here tonight. You've never been saved. You say, I don't know if God could save me. If he could save that nation one of these days after what they did to their Messiah, he could save you tonight if you'll trust Jesus Christ as your Savior.